quarantine hair. It's unnerving because I look in the mirror and um, I, I already am startled. I'm, I'm startled enough already <laughs> looking in the mirror, seeing how much I look like my, my dad, Professor Klein. But it doesn't help that I've got this long hair because dad would just not cut his hair or he would cut his hair himself in his office with a pair of scissors. And he looked like your typical like insane mad, white, scientist. mad scientist thing. And I really like having a high and tight, really like nice haircut. And... <sighs> They're open. It's not worth it. I'm not. No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, reading the data driven data driven projections. I mean, coronavirus deaths because we're reopening are gonna are gonna jump to like a, a quarter of a million dead. Don't go out. Stay home. Yeah. Be lazy. Be lazy if you can, man. It just the whole thing is just. Sorry to start on a somber note. Let's talk about something nice. Uh, we got our um, we 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 got the, that uh, the, 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 what's that bush called? What? The the green bush that I got rid of in the front. Oh, the juniper. Oh, we got rid of the juniper. God, yes. I can't. But it's amazing. So we had this huge juniper, gigantic thing, evil thing they grow and they kill everything underneath it. But I chopped all this stuff out. Finally got it out, and I left it in this huge pile on the front lawn. And I, after what four or five days, I moved it. It killed the lawn completely underneath where the where that where it was. I didn't know that junipers did that. Evil. Evil, awful, but now it's gone. She doesn't care. Nope. Two cats in here, neither of them care. But that's okay. Happy Friday. Yay. Happy Friday. Let's do wrist check. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, wrist check time. Uh -huh. We go. That's what I'm wearing. Yay! Because it, it did its thing. Yeah. On this one, I all the reason I came loose is that the hand tube was just loosened up. They have no idea what you're talking. Well, about. Well, it doesn't matter. They'll figure it out anyway. So I when I tightened that up and I set it properly, it held on. So you don't need to worry about that now. Okay. Alrighty. And I am wearing actually something unusually unusual for me and early and weird. This is a watch model I didn't even know existed until I was looking through. JDM watch Seiko catalogs from the from 1969. This is from February 69. It is a 6119-6040. And it's got that really weird early frosted handset. They only used this on a few different models at that time. Anyway, I I, I came across it in the in the in the uh, in the catalog and then I was started talking about it and Saying, hey, I didn't even know this model existed. And then one just showed up. Um, and there it is. I mean, I didn't even look for it. It just appeared. Anyway, it's a pretty neat watch. I need to actually service this. And the crown is incorrect. The, crown, the stem is not complete. And so it doesn't turn the ring. But I'll fix that. Anyway, so it's pretty cool. I've just got I've to gotta find um, a, a better uh, bezel for it. This one's banged up and I've got to redo the stem um, and I have the correct bracelet but it's got the wrong ends and I don't know I'll figure it out okay let's get started from the Chris 812 I just love seeing how old watches are able to be saved isn't it nice it's the thing that I love most about doing this work any kind of bringing machines back from the dead is just I just think it's so f wonderful it's so neat like when we finally get the MG running, like it actually rides down the road for the first time in 36 years, that's going to be just so thrilling. I just think it's neat. From Chris Graber and Shannon Priolo. Hey, Spencer and Sabrina. Had a Friday mail call question for your consideration. Was curious to know more about the Seiko case backs. Might you know why some divers have the horseshoe arrangement and others don't? Should... Well, yeah, there's two questions. Should I answer that first? Yes. Well, it depends uh, which model you're talking about. But generally, Horseshoe is... Because Seiko had all these different case back designs. I mean, they went on and on. Tons of them. What? I'm always afraid you're going to accidentally whack me. I would never do that. Unless I'm trying to kick a raccoon in my sleep. <laughs> or, who is I? Oh, that's right. I was you trying to save him. Milo from the alligator. Yeah, and he whacked me, and I woke up, and I just started smacking him. I had to try to save Milo from the alligator. Um, 
a horseshoe is was really Seiko used it starting with the seahorses, I believe, in the 60s, and they used it all the way up to the well, depending on the model, you could see them sometimes into the late 70s, but then they went to the straight case backs. I don't know why they changed it. Um, they've kind of gone back to it with some of their retro models, but I don't know. I love the horseshoe. I think it's, I think it's awesome. And the next part is, also, would you happen to know the meaning behind the evolution from the sea lion to whale to tsunami and the diver logo on the case back over the years? All of Sacra's micro-branding. Uh, I've actually been spending a lot of time going through old catalogs, the old um, JDM catalogs, and looking at the different models and the different backs, and it's just, they have this bewildering amount of different brands. I think it was all to increase sales. I mean, they had the... The original, they had the lion, and then they had the the the, the seahorse, and they had the the Olympic flame, and they they had um, they had sea lion, uh, all all these different ones, and I I think it's just in a sort of a like Seiko Five, it's these it's it's looks like a, a definitive brand marking, and it's just this sort of amorphous grouping of watches. Um, I could be underselling it, but I think that's what it was. A lot of them had to do with water resistance. But, um, I don't know. Seahorses are neat. Yes. They are neat. <laughs> I agree. I always feel bad for them, though. Why? I don't know. Because they get... I don't know. Because people should be nicer to them. Yes. From Darren Faust. Being a two, it already took the dog clippers to my head <laughs> last night. Well, you know... We used to have dog clippers that we used on my cat, um, and, but she's no longer with us, so we got rid of them. Yeah. Boy, that last session, though, before she finally passed, trying to get those knots out of her tummy fur. Yeah. Because she was old, and she stopped cleaning herself. And she was a long hair with really fine hair, and she was just this matted mess. Poor thing. Yeah. My poor cat. Nice. Sorry. I always think about my cat. I had her for 17 years, so now I have another cat. He's stupid. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but he loves you. I know. <laughs> he loves you. Okay. Uh, Richard Lenny. Hi, guys. Just discovered you a few days ago and have been watching your videos every day since. Love how you show and tell your videos. Very unique. Hope you guys stay well and safe and keep making fine videos. All the best from Richie, Rich Lenny, UFOologist. UFOlogist? UFOlogist. Oh, I thought UFOlogist. Well, it could be UFOlogist. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a UFOlogist. I'm not either. I'm a sleepyologist. I am a sleepyologist. Actually, right now I'm a breadologist. <laughs> oh, you want more bread? I do want more of that bread. <laughs> we, which we, we found this recipe for no need, um, no need bread uh, from the New York Times, and the it's you 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 mix it together the night before. And then you have this process for cooking it the next day in a cast iron pot, like a Dutch oven, in the oven. But it's really easy, and it's so good. Yep. It's really, really good. Anyway, I just wanted to put this in there to say hello to the new viewer and um, my brain. Richard Lenny. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for watching. From Spencer Braithwaite. Hey, I'm the other new moderator on the Seiko subreddit. Fancy it, that. Yeah, it's true. I can't keep your username straight, but you guys are doing a fine job. A couple of regular viewers and commenters are now helping myself and Adrian Selleck run the Seiko subreddit on Reddit. So reddit.com slash r slash Seiko. And that belongs to me. And, uh, and so anyway, there's, there's people there. If you're bored and want to chat about Seiko, go to the Seiko subreddit. What? I'm remembering the drama. <laughs> Always with the bored drama. Always. It doesn't matter where you go. You got to grab. This budget. was years ago. <laughs> uh, Tell I'm your not, story. Oh God. Do I really even want to? I already started it. The Seiko subreddit was founded by some user named on Reddit called Hesalite. And Hesalite was this I don't know. He was really weird. He owned the sub. He squatted on it, but he didn't want anything to do with it. And he let myself and a team of our guys sort of run it for a while, um, which was fine. And we never heard from Hesselet ever. And then there was this guy, this lunatic, like, I don't say that lightly, this crazy person who runs the conservative subreddit, uh, which is this, like, poisonous uh, echo chamber. 
and he, I, I got into some minor argument with him about something stupid, but he goes, it turns out that Hesselite is also part of that conservative subreddit, and Hesselite boots my entire team and gives, and gives it to this crazy person. Uh, and I lost the subreddit for like a couple of years. And then eventually I got it back because of another crazy person who, who because I got the John Wick subreddit. I, I got that because the people who founded it abandoned it. And then this person, who's like literally insane, believed that I had somehow targeted them specifically to take the John Wick subreddit away from them, even though they weren't involved with the John Wick subreddit like at all. And so that person talked to the crazy person who took over the Seiko subreddit and got the Seiko subreddit for themselves and was dangling the Seiko subreddit in front of me to get back the John Wick subreddit that I had stolen from them, even though they had no association with it. Like, literally crazy people. Um, and, and a couple <laughs> of years went by and eventually I ended up taking the Seiko subreddit back. And here we are. Not much of a story. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Like the person who took took over the John Wick subreddit, literally insane. And the only other subreddit they had was Clown Girls. I don't want to know. <laughs> it's like it's it, this person was the kind of person who thinks that, you know, watching um watching like a I don't know a, a live video of someone on television that that person is speaking to them. Like schizophrenia kind of stuff. Okay, well, we're not making fun of schizophrenic nope. people. My apologies to anybody who's suffering from that. Yes. Anyway. Anyway, on to the next one. Orlin Rusev. Ah, oh, yes. This is going to be a long question. So it's in two parts. Because he's asking, he's talking about technical stuff. Wait, so how is it in two parts? It's in one shiny paragraph. Well, yeah, but it splits. Um, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. I forgot to do it. Um... Okay, it, the first one runs up to also, and then also is the second part. Okay. Hi, Spencer. I have a question about resetting the 613839 chronographs. Have you ever considered that the damages on the minute and the center chronograph wheels is due to a poorly adjusted click spring, lack of lubrication of it, or both, and not the resetting itself? Uh, oh sure, absolutely. In fact, the 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 strength of the reset is the is a huge part of the problem. Um, when I've seen that happen, is the the reset is so strong that the sweep hand, I'm assuming because I don't have a high speed camera, deforms and as it's being pulled back because those things are really light aluminum, the reset so hard that the hand flexes and hits the minute hand on the way back up, and then that hit can also, the shock can damage the spring. Absolutely, because Seiko, unlike Swiss stuff, Swiss stuff, you, you, click, the, you click the reset button, and you're not physically clicking the, 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 the cams or anything. You're, you're, you're clicking a spring which releases a lever, and the lever goes clunk, and the heart wheels go straight up. There's it's a far gentler system. Seiko's is like, if you don't have the lubrication right or the, the strength of the spring is too hard, you go, bam, all that force goes into the reset and boom. Also, that the forces in the short resetting are higher than the long random resetting. No. Upon a random resetting of the chronograph, the hearts of the second chronograph wheel and minute chronograph wheel acts as a cushion to absorb the excess force upon resetting and the rest is dispersed as turning forces to complete the resetting of the second and minute hand in the 6139. On the 6138, there is an extra wheel and levers for the hour counter assembly. Once I add the resetting hammer and the spring to my chronograph wheel testing assembly uh, to observe the resetting action. Upon resetting, the hammer passes beyond the centers of the jewel and the washer for the wheels. The deal with this is, okay, with the 6138, and you've got that 12-hour hand with all that, that extra stuff up there, the springs that drive those are very, very weak, and they're not going to pull a lot of power off that reset, and the power that they're pulling isn't any of the power that's is that it, it's pulling power from that lever. Um, it's not pulling power from inside the mechanism at all. Um, a 
short reset, the reason I recommend the short reset, like just a few seconds past top dead center, is that there's almost no, the, the only force change would be in that case is you're gonna have the same amount of force hitting for the the pivot on the jewel. But as for the reset, you're you're not putting all this twist into it. You're not you're not dumping, you know, you're not dumping all this momentum and force into the reset. It's just a tiny little just like this. And as for the other wheels, they're gonna be in whatever position and direction they are, so that doesn't change. My main thing is to protect the hand, the hand tube, and the chronograph wheel. Um, I really only ever see this kind of damage really on the 6138s. Uh, that may be a function of the fact that they are designed to have a heavier reset because of that 12 barrel wheel, uh, but also, um, also the hand stack is potentially, I think it's a little tighter. Um, are they laughing or crying? In any case, um, I think it's an interesting point to consider, but I am a firm believer in that short reset. Uh, resetting from the bottom anywhere randomly with that main sweep, because that's what we want to protect, is a bad idea. You put it right at the top. Again, the only time I have ever personally seen a 6138 chronograph wheel fail was a hard reset that I did like 10 years ago on a UFO. I did it from with the main sweep was about 25 past and the, the minute hand was about eight or nine minutes past and I reset it and it was like, boom, just, it was this hard click. And um, all of a sudden I saw this black mark appear on the paint of the minute hand and, and it reset to zero. But from that point on the sweep was running in excess over the correct speed of the rest of the watch because all of a sudden now the clutch was slipping. And and so instead of completing a full second, a full minute in 60 seconds, it was doing 60 seconds and coming up with like a minute and eight, minute and nine, it was slipping and that was it. So I'm a big, big believer in the short reset. I wasn't listening at all. Do we have all those for your pizza? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> I looked at them the other day when I was at the store. I have some upstairs. Okay, well, that's good. And thank you for getting pineapple. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I try to make sure that I get all the stuff that you need. It's not like, and the cheese. Yes. And the cheese. <laughs> what? You're silly. Well, you know it's Freddy. Yep. Okay, for mine, Ryan Walters. Hello, Mr. Walters. Not to diminish what you do, because you know I love watches too, but these fools are getting on bitten nuts with proclamations like you owe the community. If you were Jonas Salk, I don't know who that is. He's the guy who invented the polio vaccine. And, ah. he, and when, he, when he perfected it in the 50s, because remember, every summer, years and years in the 50, 40s and the 50s, there would be another wave of polio infections. It was this thing, all these things with the kids ending up in iron lungs. Jonas Salk invented the polio vaccine. He could have patented it and become a bajillionaire. He gave away all the information for free to save as many people as possible. My loom whitening solution is not a polio cure. No. <laughs> anyway, if you're Jonas Salk, yes, you owe your work to the community, if not the world. What you have done is a remarkable thing that you are still developing and working painstakingly on. For the only people you owe anything to are those who helped you along the way and your family. I, I think what it comes down to is people who are still, I don't know, there's still all these people that, that try to control other people and people who, in, in the community, I don't know what they're talking about, the community. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're a bunch of unrelated people who, for the most part, don't know each other, who have a common hobby interest. There's no, it's not like we're going to go to the, you know, the Four Seasons Hotel in Vegas for the 2021 convention of the crazy watch enthusiasts. That, I mean, there are watch conventions, but, you know, it's just, we, this isn't, not everything belongs to everybody. No, I don't care. Milo's fur belongs to everybody. Yes, because you brush it and it goes poof. 
It goes everywhere. I really do wonder how far... He brushes it with a Furminator outside, so there's a ton of it. And then the good wind comes, and it just goes and hits I mean, cars. Milo has this really thick fur with this really fine undercoat. And you can Furminate him and Furminate him and Furminate him, and, and it goes on and on. You bred out so much, so much stuff. And we're above a mile here, and it's pretty breezy. And I let these... You blow this, like, big ball of fur, and it goes boof. And sometimes you can just see it going up and up and up. I wonder how far it's traveled. I, I just, I keep hoping because, you know, they can, the International Space Station, they've done sampling on the outside and they've actually found um, algae from the surface of the ocean that got picked up and got high enough and into basically low orbit and ended up on the ISS. My sincere hope is that they're going to go out there and find Milo hair. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? That would be awesome. They'd be like, why is there white cat fur on our solar ray assemblies? Two four seven eighty T. Whenever you say you owe the community, all I think of is a bunch of entitled crybabies. You don't owe anything to anybody. I hope you perfect your process and get rich on it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm still working on it. I'm still perfecting it. And it may be that I have reinvented the wheel. Um, I don't know yet. I'm, I'm doing more tests now. Um, I don't know. It's just one of those one of those things. It always rings a few minutes early. Yeah, it always rings up, like two or three minutes early. I still have to work on it. I've been meaning to you for a good number of years now. <laughs> uh, from Ryan Walters again. I'm pretty sure the novel of Vonnegut's that you're referencing is Breakfast of Champions. Mm. Though the loss of authorial control is a reoccurring motif throughout much of his work. I was really excited to hear you filtering your understanding through Vonnegut such a wonderful author. Oh uh, yeah, I grew up reading Kurt Vonnegut. Um, actually, for a few reasons. We had all the books in the house, and uh, I was always a fan of science fiction and that kind of stuff, which pushes boundaries. And he talks a lot about sort of the human experience and how we perceive life and what is reality and that kind of stuff. And it's great. Part of the reason, too, though, is that my dad... Um, Kurt Vonnegut's brother was Bernard Vonnegut. Bernard Vonnegut was an atmospheric scientist. Uh, and my dad's... His basically his first PhD and his first book was about environmental. He was a microbiologist. Was about environmental impacts of silver iodide on aquatic environments. Silver iodide is what you use for cloud seeding uh, to create rain. And so he and Bernard Vonnegut actually they worked together on this book. Uh, and so I always felt like I had a little bit of a I don't know. Uh, uh, one degree of separation from Kurt Vonnegut. But yeah, he's kind of always in my head, Kurt Vonnegut's always, especially about time travel and all that other kind of stuff and perception of time and what it means to be human. I might always not worried about that. No. I've only read Slaughterhouse-Five, so I don't know what you're talking about. I think about Slaughterhouse-Five all the time. Ugh. All the time. It's always in my head. And then last year, we, I found those photographs taken in well i don't want to go into that now okay why don't we continue on from randy allen sorry for using non seco acronyms f-o-i-s first omega in space that makes sense now i understand a close replica to the early speed masters with straight lugs and no guards for the pusher and stem also the alpha style hands vice and the stick style on the speedy pros recalls the watch that astronaut Wally Shira mm -hmm. wore on the Mercury missions. Yeah, the very first, the ones that went up and they were just like first Americans in space, like orbiting on the planet. Predates the introduction of the professional and NASA certification. Love Sabrina's DeVille, very classy and glad to hear you, you're back to your MG. Must be summer there. Yeah, the, I, th I think those, those dudes, those early Gemini dudes, I think they literally went to a watch shop somewhere in Houston and bought Omegas. And they were adopted by NASA later. I think that's what happened. I'm not really sure. Yeah, her Omega DeVille is so cool. So elegant. And yeah, the MG's going. I have... Uh, I, I haven't been making videos about the MG's because, I don't know, people seem to be really annoyed about the fact that I am doing anything, anything except working on customer watches. But I have the entire interior of the MG ripped out except for the dash and the steering wheel. 
Um, and so I've, I've, I really can see what's going on with it now. Uh, I pulled out the, she walked out of the garage last weekend just in time to see me removing the windshield. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. From Garrett Jansen. Okay, this is a long one, but is he it? very kindly put things in different paragraphs. Number diddlies. Yep. Did Sebastian say thank you at 3421? Because that's adorable if he did. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, well, he's adorable. He is adorable. And he and he, he knows his manners. Yeah. Um, more or less. More or less, as well as a child can. He's better than his sister. Uh, one, your loom solution, your property. Hell, patent it if you can. You already bring enough genuine value to the community anyways. You're not under any obligation to share. We don't see Rolex sharing um, their tech with Omega. I just, you know, right now my biggest barrier to doing any kind of sharing is the idea that um, it's not perfected yet. And I'm still getting inconsistent results. Uh, it seems to behave differently depending the kind of the kind of damage that's on there. And I can't I can't look at a damage dial and say, this is what it's gonna look like when it's done. I'm not quite there yet. I'm sorry, I've got a reminder coming up. Okay. I there. came back. What? The, the Willow's teacher has a Google Classroom, like a Zoom thing every Friday while we're making the video. So, we, and also I'm really sick of having to do things other than work, so I don't care. And that's what pops up all the time. Eventually it'll stop. I hope, did it pop up again? No, I'm oh. saying that like the last three weeks it's been happening. I need to take it off my calendar. I don't know how that happened. Um, anyway. Okay, two. You have several videos where you restore and break down a 613839, but I haven't seen you break down and restore a 701618. Is one in the pipeline or a Bellmatic 4006 movement? The restoration videos are awesome for a dozen reasons, and I thoroughly appreciate the work put into them. I have two 7016s. One's actually already done, uh, but I haven't published the video, and I have another one right after it. I haven't, I had to hunt down the crystals for those watches, both of the, the, the tank style 7016s, the, 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 the Monaco style ones. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I definitely want to work on those. I have two queued up. Uh, I also want to do a Bellmatic, uh, literally for myself. I have all these parts Bellmatics and you know, it'd be nice to put one together. They're such beautiful movements. Um, they're kind of a pain to service, but um, I want to go through and do that. But people don't send those in. I don't see a lot of those chronographs come in. I don't see a lot of Bellmatics come in. Um, so that's one of the reasons. I'm, I mostly made my name doing the chronographs. So the, the SUA chronographs. So that's mostly what you're going to see is SUA stuff. Three, more general question. With vintage watches, water damage can show up in a variety of places, but I assume it's not from people swimming or washing hands, but rather moisture in the air, no? When you take a case back off and see pitting, is the condensed vapor or straight water getting in there? Does that also explain why watches in very humid environments look so much worse? I think what happens is when I see pitting, um, typically you have a watch that's dirty, uh, that hasn't been serviced or opened up, and so you get this debris, this gruck, in these tight spaces, and it'll hold water, and or moisture, or whatever. Uh, I mean, I saw, I did a watch a few weeks ago where the original owner hadn't cleaned it in forever. It looked like he wore it for a couple of decades straight without cleaning it, and there was pitting in the stainless steel on the outside of the case underneath these layers of gruck that were on the watch. Like literally there's pitting in the in that thing. So that's the thing. If if it's if there's anything that can hold moisture against the metal, even stainless steel, then it's gonna it's gonna patina. You give enough time and the seals fail and you're in a humid environment and clearly you're not taking care of your watch, you're gonna have moisture get inside and it's gonna start condensing under the crystal and destroying the handset. And yeah, you're gonna see discoloration of the plating and it's gonna go on and on and on. So yes. 
This channel is a refreshing break from other major watch channels because you're actually qualified to talk about technical details. Sort of. I don't take a lot of stock in someone waxing poetic about a watch's design when they've probably never studied any principle in design. You lend a much needed and different perspective in the community and I thought deserved to be said. Thank you. Apologies, Sabrina, for the long comment. As I said, it's broken down, so I'm okay with that. It's when it's a giant block of text, I'm like, no. What? Hmm? What are you staring at? Nothing. You missed it. What was it? A, a car that had an interesting top rack. What? <laughs> I was like, that's an interesting top rack. I thought you were going to say it was a bunny or something. No. God, I had to drive to the mailbox because the mail people drive so quickly I can't ship out packages. And a woman was on her bike with her dog because they walk their dog while they're on their bike with their with their kid in the back trailer and a bunny ran right in front of her and she totally wiped out. Because the dog went after it, right? Yes. Wow. This is why I don't think riding a bike with a dog is the best idea. I can't figure out a single way that it would work. Cause, I don't know. Like, imagine trying to do that with Rocket. He'd pull him instantly. <laughs> uh, okay. Chrono Craze. Maybe this may have been asked somewhat recently, but what do you think of the new non-limited edition Captain Willard reissue in a more compact 42.5 millimeter size? Uh, well, let's look at those really quick. Uh, hang on. Sabrina wants a milkshake. <laughs> We're having this giant conversation, and then I suddenly say I want a milkshake. Everything's fine. You know, I like milkshakes. Yep. Though we recently had uh, um, McDonald's shakes, and they're just, they're not quite as good as I remember. No, Chick-fil-A's are better. Chick-fil-A's are better. Oh, what I wouldn't give for Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, I need to read the rest of this. Currently, I... Oh, wait, I never answered the question. No, you, you paused it to go talk. Oh, okay, story. well, anyway. Oh, you're right. Go on. What? Sorry, we got sidetracked. <laughs> We're talking about the new non-limited edition reissue of the Willard, the 6105. Currently, I think only two variants, the SPB-151 and the SPB-153. I think it's pretty cool. It is now closer to an SKX. The original... <coughs> Uh, case was so comfortable already, being smaller and probably a little lighter might make it e even more so. The only thing I am a little offended by is the $1,100 and up price tag. Crazy how most prospect lines ha prospects lines have now nearly doubled in retail price within the past year alone. But hey, this is Seiko now. What can you do about the price hikes? For that much, I think I prefer to go with the tuna. I don't know. The SPB 153 in olive green is a damn handsome watch, though. Um, yeah, I mean, the price point is... I, I wouldn't... I don't support the price being that high. I don't know what their basis for that is. Like, there's a, there was a couple... I'm having trouble remembering it now, but I found a JDM limited edition Seiko like field watch that was made, uh, I think, last year. Uh, and I don't remember the model right now, but it's beautiful. Like the dial is just, it looks really cool. Uh oh. Uh, the dial looks really cool. And I was looking at it, I actually found one. Uh, and I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I was looking at it, I'm like, I'm not paying that much money for it because it's just a different dial in a case on a on a four or three six movement who who cares um and with this thing it's like my my confidence in seiko's qc process is not high that said i'd be interested in looking at it more closely i i wish the price was better one thing that i will say okay is that i love that so answer. quick digression. One of the things I love about the handset on the SPB 151 and 153, I believe, is, as I said, the handset is gabled. What I mean by that, if you look at this original, come on, darn it, would you stop it? Would you focus? Okay. See, look, the center parts of the hand are flat, right? And they've got little angles on each side, little bevels on each side, but the middle is flat. Seiko had a variant 
of this handset. They made a lot of, a number of different dress watches by with like five or six different kinds of movements that used this same handset. So like here's one, and you can see it's got that green Dyni Loom. This is a 7005 version. Again, flat. There's a number of these though that use a different handset. Ever so slightly different. I never hear anybody talking about them, but I call them gabled. They're not flat in the middle. They have, they have this, ugh, darn it. Yeah, it drives me crazy too, I know. Stop it. It has this peak or this gable running down the middle. And I'm always, always, always tempted to use these on a 6105 build for myself because I actually prefer it. So the fact that the new reissue uses a gabled handset like this, to me, I think is really awesome. It's a great callback to this, this sort of unknown hand variant, very much like the 6105. I just think it's more elegant. I think it's more balanced than having the flat handset. This, it gives, the, gives it more depth having the gable. I just think it's neater looking. I love the handset. The, um, the, the way that it's, it's like the, how they interpreted the classic 6105 long, long baton hands with the big loom plots, but they, it doesn't look like that, but they also didn't go the way of how the Marine Masters look. She was looking at you funny. How the Marine Masters look. Basically, they, re, they created a new style handset that's gabled. It has this like, it's, it's, it's like, has like a roof, like a, like a line going down the middle. I love the handset. I think it's great. I hate the red stoplight. I wish it was orange. Um, but the, the hour and minute hands are awesome. 1100 is too much. Uh, six, 700 is, in my opinion, that's where it ought to be. But yeah, I mean, I want to look at them more closely. We've considered actually saying, well, you know, it's for the business. We could invest in one and I could do a review of one. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We can talk about it. She's so sweet when she wants today. She loves us. She loves you. No, she loves you too. Sort of. From F. Sohail, regarding the loom, I would 100% not give it away, duh. I would, however, consider partnering with a chemist of some sort to refine and stabilize the, resort, the results of the compound and then get it out to market and reap the well-deserved benefits. Oh, and patent the crap out of it. Yeah, no, Sabrina agrees with you. Mm -hmm. I think that, and I mean, we're right by a university with PhD students that need work. Yeah, I mean, I don't, the thing is, I'm, to say I'm not a chemist is like, man, I remember taking chemistry and all that stuff. And I just, I can't, I can't, it's, it's beyond me. And I'm more of a, an artist in the sense that I kind of do stuff and sometimes it works and I kind of remember what I did and not all the time. You have an artistic brain. I do have an Except artistic you brain. you also have a mechanical brain. Well, then, no, that's, I, I, I can see things in shapes and, and colors and designs and things, but hard data stuff, numbers and, 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 and chemicals and things like that well, and chemical chemicals, bonds. No. And I, I just, I can't, I can't hold that stuff together. I can, I can picture a machine in my mind in 3D. Like I can see it. I can rotate it in my head. I can take it apart. I can see how it, how it works by itself. But like the other, I was working on a movement. Uh, and I was trying to solve a crazy problem and I had to sit there and I realized I didn't know how many teeth the wheel, a wheel in a movement had. So I had to sit there and blow up pictures of my computer and count teeth because I didn't know the answer. You think I'd know that stuff, but I don't. What? Uh, Julie Hill, Breathe the Community. Firstly, it sounds like a great title for a horror movie. Secondly, we have an expression here in the UK, which is not so queer as folk, which basically means people are weird. <laughs> and ain't that the truth? 
Um, people have their own hang-ups and motivations and reasons for treating others the way they do. We all have enough crap to deal with in life without having to deal with other people's crap as well. Reach a stage in my life when I can cut loose any of the crap in a heartbeat. Life's way too short. Own a camper van. I gave up on VW forums a long, long... I was looking at the length of the current portion of the video. You gave up on VW forums. Uh, forums full of pricks. Pricks. All of them. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody's got an opinion. They think that not only are they entitled to it, you are as well. Okay, how many more pages? Do you need to take a break? Do you need snack time? Sure. Snack time. Um... I'm about to, we're about to get answer from BRS, Brandon Small. Um, the first question about your case back markings on the 2205s, I have no idea what A1 means. I'm, I, I apologize, I wish I did, but I don't. I don't know. I, I, I vaguely remember something about A1 stuff. Like if you read about the 6309 Buyer's Guide, they talk about case back markings, and they might be applicable to your thing, but I, I don't know what they are. But the second part of your question, what are your opinions of flip clocks? I like them. Seiko made some really funky stuff, and I've started a small collection of Copel and Seiko. Hope to hear from you. Love the videos. I grew up with a, with a flip clock. Uh, I, I, it was an American-made one, I think, or maybe early Japanese. I just think they're really cool. My only problem with them is that they're loud. And when they flick over, they go, pluck. Oh, one of those? Yeah, one of the ones with the numbers that goes like this. Well, first uh, timekeeping machine I ever took apart was one of those. Was that at the old house? No, no, it was when I was a kid, oh, when I was little. Because we had one you got at a tag sale at the old house on your workbench, do you remember? Vaguely, yeah. Did I when ever get Sadie it to work? When was small enough to um, sit there. No, it worked fine, but it drove me crazy. What happened to it? We must have donated, donated it. it. Yeah, no, but when I was little, I, I, uh, we had a flip clock at home and it stopped working. And I took it apart. I just remember all the, the flippy things. It looked like a, a Rolodex, but with numbers on it. It was wild. I think they're cool. Did you ever fix it? Mm -mm. <laughs> I, but I found parts of it for years afterwards. Years and years afterwards, I found parts of it scattered around the house. Um, Adrian Hargreaves. Hi, guys, and thanks for answering my question. It was really enjoyable for me as I sold my MM300 and missed it, and I'm halfway through saving... For my Submariner, it was just having a wobble. Like you said, they're way too expensive. Yeah, you know, Submariners versus... A Marine Master is a Marine Master is a Marine Master. They are their own thing stylistically, and they're kind of... One of the things that's nice about them, a Marine Master, is that they are... It's not like you have to, you're have you showing off and being like, Ooh, look at my wrist, it's so cool. Because somebody, a stranger, would have to really be on their game to recognize what's on your wrist so you get the thrill of wearing a high quality piece and all and 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 if anybody were to see it they would have to be in the know versus a Rolex it's like you know it's like driving a you know a 7 series BMW or something or even higher end than that you know you're sort of showing off to people who don't even know anything about watches would be like ooh it's a Rolex they've heard of it but the only way i could justify investing in another sub and remember, I sold my old sub to buy this one. The reason I bought this one is that it was complete with everything. I had the box and tags, history, the whole thing is absolutely 100% complete, in great condition. And it's one of the rarest, if not the rarest, Rolexes like ever made. They were only made for like 9 or 10 or 11 months. The 168000, the transition, the, they call them the triple zero. Not only that, mine has the the super rare Mark II variant dial with the Z-shaped S. Um, so it's like double crazy stupid rare. And I got it for less than, I like, we, I had some money left over from selling my old, one uh, my my old uh, one six uh, one six six one zero, and more and more people talk about these. So this is going to be a good investment for the future. But that was the only way I could justify it. And on her submarine submarine submarine, <laughs> I I built that thing out of parts. So, you know, that's the only way I can justify this stuff. K 
20. Hello, Spencer. I was curious to know what is the best result you have gotten from regulating a 7, 7019 movement. I've regulated my own and haven't been able to get further than plus minus 30 seconds a day. Thanks. Oh, uh, well, the first thing we need to do is to ask, do you have a time grapher? Do you know what the, uh, the only reason I ask that is because, one, it'll make regulation much easier, but two, it'll tell you the amplitude. The amplitude of a watch is, is everything. So if you have a watch that isn't serviced and has low amplitude, it's just not going to be that accurate. It just won't be. Um, it's a pretty broad question. Um, 7,000 series watches serviced properly will run very accurately, very, very accurately, a handful of seconds a day maybe less. It's always hard to get an automatic to dial in that tight, but you can do it with the 7000 series. With what you're talking about, I would strongly, firstly recommend, if you don't have a time grapher, get one. They're only, these days, they're only a few hundred dollars, and they will tell you everything. Numbers don't lie, and the problems cannot hide. You look so mournful. What? Because I was just drinking tonic water and it tastes weird with being not in something else. Well, I thought you said you liked it. No, I like the fancy one. Oh, well, they don't. Is there, no, they're there, upstairs. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, whatever. Because it says sucrose in it. Oh, you don't like sucrose. No. You can leave that for me. I'll drink it. Are you sure? Sure, I don't care. I used to love tonic water back when I was an alky. Okay, but you're not anymore. It's kind of, I don't know. I don't know, but it's, no, it's, it's a fine, refreshing beverage. Okay. Uh, okay. From Rick. LOL, it's Sabrina's mom stare that should have been the thumbnail. It comes natural. Yes. <laughs> All of my Seikos have case codes and dial codes that are different. Pretty sure they're supposed to be two different references. Been doing a lot of research lately about the the various Seiko companies and what makes them different. It seems that the Daini versus Sua rivalry is still alive and well in the form of S2 and Epson. Turns out, all right, is that? I no, it's, S2, it's S, S2, which is basically Daini. Okay, I just want to make sure I said the right thing. Yeah. Turns out they both make watch parts and movements, but in their own way. S2 is more about engineering mechanics and materials and things like spring alloys, ball bearings, metal tools, batteries, etc. And all the Seiko pure, is it working? Yeah, it's working. Pure mechanical movements um, come from them, including the fancy Grand Seiko Studio, where they make the 9S stuff. Epson, meanwhile, is more generally an electronics company, and they make things like printers, robots, software, and the more high-tech quartz Seiko movements, including anything with solar or GPS and Grand Seiko's 9R spring drive and 9F quartz movements. I'm normally not that into quartz stuff, but looking at Epson's history makes me appreciate it more. And of course, Epson owns Orient, its own brand, with its own mechanical movements, which is just weird. I thought for some reason that all of the, the Grand Seiko stuff was still built in the the Sua factory. I, I'm not saying I'm right. I just, uh, that's what I thought. So I thought all that Grand Seiko stuff was underneath that that um, umbrella, but I could be wrong. Uh, it's interesting because I associate. There's just so much I don't know. Let me put it that way. There's so much I don't know, but that's very interesting. Thank you for telling me about this stuff. <sighs> Saul Brook. There are two things I think of when I think of a unique design language of Orient. Their King Diver line, which which whenever I see it screams Orient, and the way they integrate power reserve meters into their Orient Star logo, especially when they are crouching on the 12 o'clock marker and eat into the 12. I find power reserve markers meters generally pointless, as it, but it gives the top of these dials a little odd smile. Yeah, you know, power reserve stuff, I mean, if it's a... If it's a like a spring drive or something like that, then sure, then that makes sense. But they're 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 a very silly little thing. It's just a sliding wheel, and it just it can turn a certain amount before it takes the hand and starts moving it. I thought it was super complicated, but it's not. Who was the garden box people? Oh, what they have to say? They asked if Wednesday's okay to deliver, and they asked for our address. How in the world are we going to get it in the backyard? I think they assemble it here. Oh, okay. Lots of good news. All right. Um, from 
Archie, hi SNS, couple of questions for the next mail call. If you have possessed or serviced a Seiko Shinkansen? 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 I don't know. I don't know. Wristwatch, Quartzo is issued to the Shinkansen Bullet Train Crew with only 100 produced all in 2007. What are your impressions of the watch in the 7N movement? Um, well, that's a, that's a two-part question, right? Well, let me talk about the seven and the seven and movement is 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 pretty basic. Um, it's I mean it's still a metal train. It's got I think uh, two jewels. Um, they're 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 good but base movements. They're not world beaters in any way. There's no real way to adjust them. And I mean it, it's better than some a lot of quartz movements which are 100% plastic. So it's certainly better than that. Um, it's a very, it's a base quartz movement. It is what it is. Oh, and I don't know anything about that particular one of 100. There's so much about Seiko I don't know. I've read that Seiko engineers who developed the twin quartz in the 70s and 80s consider 8J to be the best quartz caliber Seiko ever developed. It was discontinued due to an extreme production cost and replaced with the more economical 9F. You've probably serviced both. What's your opinion? Uh, I have actually not serviced either model, ever. After re Never. After reading your question, I did some research on the 8Js. And what's interesting is that one can buy a you can buy a, a, a quasi semi-vintage grand seiko quartz with one of those movements and they tend to be around a thousand dollars up to eighteen hundred dollars if somebody's really trying to make some coin and they look pretty neat but there's also you can get them in um in a bunch of like these sort of you know lower end looking seiko seiko watches dress watches that aren't particularly attractive for like a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars with this supposedly amazing 8J movement in them. So one day when I have enough pennies, I will, um, I'll probably get one of the inexpensive ones. Um, it, it just so I can see the movement, that'd be pretty cool. Unless I see one of these quartz, grand quartz watches examples and then we'll go for that. I don't know, do I really need a quartz grand Seiko? Not really. No. No. You don't like quartz watches much. I don't. I, it's not that I don't like them. I admire the technology, but I always I feel more bonded with mechanicals, mm. especially automatic mechanicals. Shedding. Um, from Ivan Lucas. Hi Spencer. I have a Seiko two six two five zero zero one zero, which is basically like the quartz version of the two two zero five. High beat lady diver. When I first got it, it was running 1.2 seconds fast per day, but with a bit of regulation, mostly luck, I managed to get it to 0.1 seconds slow after five days. Not bad for a 39 year old watch. My question is how does the 2625 movement compare with other Seiko Quartz movements like the 7548? I have only one left right now. Uh, it's rusty, but let me pull it out okay. and let's look at it. So this. This is a Seiko 2205. It's basically, it's the ladies 6105. It's an exquisite watch design. I'm so sad that one of these does not exist in a full men's size. This watch in a, in a full men's size would be fantastic. Uh, Raven Watch's newest watch is a version of this. He took, apparently, I asked him about it, and he, and he said, only you would have n noticed that that case design came from this. And so if you look at Raven's design, their newer watch, this is what it is. Um, so that's the closest thing, and I need to get one of those. Okay, but this is mechanical. Seiko also created a quartz version. And there it is. Now, this one has some water damage. It's rusty. But the quality of the movements on these is actually quite good. Hang on just one second. They're all metal. Jewel trains, heavily, heavily built. The the way that the the movement is constructed is a lot more like um, it's much more like a seven five four eight than anything. Uh, it's got a few things in common with the seven C, like it's got this this resistance spring here which stops the sweep from moving, so you get a tighter, cleaner click. But this movement reminds me actually more of like the the 4004 or the 3003 quartz movements. They're really, they're nicely made. They're nicely made. And these are high quality watches. 
I'm sorry this one is destroyed. And I'm also sorry that it's a ladies watch. Because they are very neat. And you can see the, the lineage. They're almost identical. They're just different movements. But of course this has that magnificent handset. Gosh, I wish they had made one of these with a with a case where like this up to this portion minus the crown guard was like 39 millimeters but everything else done the same way oh that'd be awesome that'd be just fantastic god it'd be so cool so that's the story with that wow amazing <laughs> from Bjorn Glamo Hi, SNS. I want to start by saying I really enjoy your videos. Thank you. I am a fairly new subscriber, and I get all happy when I realize you have so many videos I haven't watched yet. I have a few questions for the next mail call. I have been thinking about getting a watch for my birth year. However, I have been unable to find scanned Seiko catalogs for 1989. Is it me that can't Google properly, or is there a reason why a 1989 catalog is missing? Well, there's another question. Okay. Uh 89 is, uh, the catalogs have to be out there. Uh, most of the focus of major Seiko people, though, is going to be like Seiko's golden age, which is like, in my book, is like <coughs> basically 1964 to like 1988. That's like, and mostly more towards the late 60s and early 70s. That's the real thing. And so those are easy to find. The catalogs must exist. They must exist. You might look on eBay perhaps to see if somebody's selling literally a physical catalog. Uh, 89, I think the most unusual diver they had at that time, that was after all of the SUA stuff had been discontinued. Um, 89, though, you could get um, a 7C46 ashtray. Sika was producing a good number of 7C46 watches at the time. 7C43, 7010 uh, is another cool one. Uh, and they had a few of those. They're quartz, but... They are neat. Uh, failing that, 89, you would have to be starting to dig into the 7002 divers for automatic uh, mechanicals. They're fighting outside now. Well, there, then you answered the next. I did? Also, do you have any suggestions for cool Seiko divers that were being produced in May 1989? There you go. I'm fairly new to Seiko, so my knowledge about the watches Seiko produced at that time is very limited. And another question, I recently acquired a 7387060. However, the end links are missing for the original bracelet. Do you, by any chance, know if there are end links that match the case? Um, he, oh yeah, absolutely. Hang on just one second. Oh no. What? I don't like when you leave me. Uh, I, uh, honey, I'm never going to leave you. No, I mean when you leave me in front of the camera. Uh, I thought I had a case over here for this. 7060. Uh, He's frantic. No, 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 no. I haven't, <laughs> I'm, I've been trying to resurrect another watch, and I happen to be digging this out. Oh, that's a 7290. I have to research that and, and get back to you. Um, those end links typically are, are pretty easy to find, um, but I need to do some research on them. Tom N. Hi, Sabrina and Spencer. Spencer has the MK40 Speedy getting any wrist time. I Not as much as I sh it should. I've been looking at them myself on and off and pulled the trigger on a black dial one today. Yeah, they're, uh, I mean, the, the, they're, they're cool. Uh, it's The problem is my Mark 40 is hidden. Uh, it's underneath another watch, and so I keep forgetting that I own it. Lester loves watches. Can you show the process of getting the amplitude up? It went from about 211 to 260. Great instructional video. Thanks. There's no, there's no one method to do it. Uh, it just some, you know, sometimes I do things right, and then you know when the when the lubrication, especially the 9410 moves on the pallet stones and transfers and smooths out as it should, you'll see that number jump. I mean, really rock it up. Sometimes there's I haven't done something correct or there's some slop somewhere that I haven't caught and that number doesn't jump. It's every now, I, I, I can't say, this is the 17 step process for making your amplitude go to 260. I don't have an answer for that because every movement is different because of the changes of time and where and all that kind of stuff. 
Sometimes it does that, sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, which is more often than it doing it, then it's, you know, I have to go back in and start poking. But we just got lucky on that one. <clears throat> From A.V. Cuber. Hi, Spencer and Sabrina. Spencer, I had this question that's been bothering me a lot. Why is it that I can't find anything on the Seiko 61 6000 horseshoe? Well, I don't know. I looked up 61-6000. I didn't find anything. But I did find the 66-6000 which is a hand winder with a horseshoe. Um, and it, might that be it? Uh, it's a, I don't know, it's, a, it's an interesting watch. I'm gonna insert a picture of it right here. Uh, anyway, I don't know much about them. 61 implies that it would be part of the 61, like 6105, 6106, 6119. It may be that there was a no date hand wine hand wind version of that Seiko did that a few times like there's the Seiko 7000 movement which is a hand wind no date 7000 series they did the same thing with um 63 uh, of the 6309s there's a 6300 movement no date hand wind if there's a 6100 movement no date hand wind I haven't heard of it but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist but like you I wasn't able to find anything oh it's a shiny car no, it's not. Oh, it's not a shiny car? No, I think it's a fit. Oh, it's a fit. Don't right. see shiny cars too much anymore. No. From Animal Kisser. What do you mean Seikos are designed to run longer but not necessarily be a forever kind of movement? They're good enough and built well enough that they will run strongly for 8 to 10 years. They're not designed... They're designed kind of loose. Um with a little bit of slop so they they will continue to run um they don't tend to bind up and being a little dirty doesn't really bug them um but they they don't their long-term survivability starts to seriously drop off at a certain point and the i have always felt that the point was do you get x number of years out of this watch and then the the thing drops and you can service it or not but they want you to buy a new one they even admit it with the new arnie but saying that thing's going to suck after five years. Yeah, versus, like, I just went through <clears throat> Rolex 1570 movement. Like, okay, imagine I've got a, a Seiko 6105 gear train. The thing is on there. And I start the gears moving. There's no power in it or anything. I just, I, I turn it so the gears are going. The gears are going to, they'll run for just a second, maybe, if I put a little bit of manual turning into them. And then they'll stop. They'll just, you turn them and they stop. There's like, they don't glide at all. Rolex 1570 movement, you put the train on and you put just a, not even spring power or anything. You just put a little bit of momentum into that gear train and it will sit there even without lubrication and it will just spin. It's, it's so tight and it's so well machined and so clean and it's like, it's designed to live for a very long time with regular maintenance. Seiko is designed to give good performance for so amount of time. And then the expectation is that you don't necessarily service that and you just move on to a new watch. Different priorities. Yeah, it is amazing, boy. You put the train bridge down on a Rolex movement like that because the wheels, the pivots are bigger and the surfaces are finer and they're finely polished. And the wheel, the brass themselves of the gears is thicker and heavier. It has more material. And so it's one of the things that like a 1570, one of these Rolex movements, they have a lot of momentum. It takes them a little bit, especially with that free sprung balance to kind of get up to speed. But once they do, it just sits there. It's like a, it's like having a, a flywheel almost in terms of all this material momentum keeping going. And Seiko's not built like that at all. Anyway, is that it? Mm-hmm. You did fine. Well, thank you. And Milo didn't attack us once. I know. I'm so happy. He, When Kraken was over here, he woke up and he was looking at us, but then he went back to sleep. Yeah, I saw him. He was sitting over there and he was kind of blinking at me with one eye, <laughs> but then he passed out again. Oh, to be a cat. Oh, to be a cat. I will see this weekend uh, about maybe making a quick overview about what's going on with the MG, because why not? Oh, God, and I've got to call to see if the darn truck is ready. 
They've had our truck, our new truck. They've had the truck in the dealership for three weeks. Because the transmission blew. Blew, which is something that with happened. thirty thousand miles. Yeah, that's something that happens to that truck. No. And we've been waiting for three weeks. <laughs> to get our truck back. Yep. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you so much for your questions and everything else like that. And we hope you have a fantabulous day. And a good weekend. And a good weekend. And remember, don't go nuts and running around and everything else like that. Be safe. Be safe. There's a great article. Maybe I'll put a link into it, into this thing, on how the coronavirus, and this is actual scientific stuff, how the coronavirus actually spreads using real world examples of previous infection events that have happened this thing like uh, actual things with people that they trained that they that they tracked down and they were able to reconstruct the situation in which groups of people were infected and they have diagrams of like the restaurant how it happened and stuff like that maybe i'll put that link in there but got to be careful because this stuff is going to be gnarly People think it's going to get that we're over the hump. Oh, no. We're not only not over the hump because people think we're over the hump, it's going to get worse. And then my mother goes out to eat. <laughs> I can't help your mother. Nothing's going, to, nothing's going to kill her anyway. No, she'll live forever. I know, but you're thinking about death of my mother. I'm not thinking about No, I'm thinking about the fact that your mother's unkillable. <laughs> you're mean. I'm not mean. I like your mother. Okay. Oh, She's funny. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, just... Some people are going to live forever. Okay. She's one of them. I hope so. I hope they don't get corona. Oh, a smart car. Yep. Okay. Bye, folks. Bye.